okay so welcome to the stream today and uh i hope that your sessions have been great uh over the last two days that was yesterday and today and uh, tomorrow we are looking at advanced taxation and principles of taxation and so we, we are taking the time to look at the various things that we need to remind ourselves on revise as we get ourselves tomorrow 9 a.m for principles of taxation 2 p.m for advanced taxation and i'm believing that tonight's session is going to be uh, an additional add-on session for you to enable you remind yourself of the fundamental issues that you need to understand as you get yourself into the exam hall and uh, we are live on face uh, youtube i think so yeah on youtube as well so if there are any questions you have for me something you want me to share my thought on you can put them in the comment section for me for those of you on youtube those of you on uh zoom with me also you can put it in the comments or the chat for me or raise your hand i bring you up subject to the fact that you have a good background so we don't have a lot of noise coming into the stream as we go into the discussion okay so wanted to make sure that my sound is great here so let's get straight up into the discussion taxation very interesting area let's see what we can do in the next few minutes that we have on our clock today so taxation now when it comes to the taxation examination whether you're in principles of taxation or advanced taxation there are a number of fundamental principles that you need to understand which will then position you to be to be able to ultimately pass the examination so what i want to do first is to try as much as possible and walk through some principles with you some fundamental issues that you need to understand when it comes to taxation in general discussing the key issues and the key areas that the examiner is going to be bringing questions on so that we can then position ourselves to ultimately pass the examination and you know become successful generally so first thing first there is a couple of things that we need to understand the first one is corporate tax liabilities what are in principles of taxation or advanced taxation this is going to be in the exam hall done deal waiting for you corporate tax liabilities that is going to be in the exam hall but when it comes to corporate tax liabilities it is not just corporate tax liability so under corporate tax liabilities there are a number of principles that you have to be mindful of and that is what i want to be excited about just so you know when it comes to dealing with corporate tax liabilities all we are doing is we are changing the accounting profit into the taxable profit because remember financial statements of a company will be prepared in accordance with the issue in respect of the IFRSs and for the most part the IFRSs will give certain treatments that may not be allowable or acceptable when it comes to dealing with the issue about the tax laws and so things like depreciation it's allowable for tax purposes impairment is allowable for tax purposes uh, dealing with amortization is allowable sorry for the IFRS purposes but when it comes to tax all those things will not be recognized for tax purposes and so for for the from the perspective of tax what is going to be happening is that we are going to ask ourselves is this expense uh, expenses wholly exclusively and necessarily these are the three main things that we will be looking out for so for an expenses to be allowable for tax purposes it should be wholly incurred for the entity it should be exclusive to the entity and it should be necessary in other words without that expenses the activities of the organization cannot continue that is a fundamental issue that we need to understand but let's get excited into some key principles that we have to be aware of when it comes to dealing with corporate tax liabilities. The first thing has to do with capital allowance. Whether I like it or not, there is a 99% opportunity that either you're going to have a dedicated question on capital allowance or you are going to use the principles of capital allowance to solve a whole 20 marks question or a 15 mark question in the exam hall. So capital allowance is a fundamental issue when it comes to dealing with taxation, whether principles of taxation or advanced taxation. So let's start with the basic principles that you need to understand. 
when it comes to dealing with capital allowance its treatment it's different from traditional companies when i say traditional companies i mean companies that are operating outside the petroleum and mining industry so these companies will have different rules for accounting for their capital allowance whilst the companies in the mining and petroleum operations will also have different rules for their mining uh, for their capital allowance treatment so let's first get into the traditional companies how do we deal with capital allowance for traditional companies in respect of the traditional companies we are going to be using what we call the pooling system okay the pooling system the pooling system simply states that the assets of the entity will be classified into five major groups and accounted for in that manner the key thing we must understand here is how the pooling system works on the overall and so from class one to class three assets they are going to be accounted for car, uh, capital allowance will be granted on a reducing balance basis okay on a reducing balance basis whilst assets in pool four and pool five will be accounted for on straight line basis okay now i will not go into the individual types of assets in each class though but you know data inputs uh devices computer and those things are going to be in class one and all of those things things of permanent structure will be in class four and all those things so class one to class three uh, we are going to be calculating the capital allowance on the reducing balance basis F four and five we are going to be calculating the capital allowance on a straight line basis that is the first thing you need to understand the second thing is that assets in pool one to pool three lose the identity what does that mean it means that when there is an addition during the year all we do is sub, uh, add it to the written down value brought forward so all we do is bring the written down value brought forward of the pool and then if there is any addition boom you just add purchases during the year to it and that is all in that particular case so you get your restated balance and that restated balance is what you are going to then use to calculate the capital allowance for the year so assets in pool one to pool three lose the identity so subsequent to the first year of operations what is going to happen is that any asset that is bought whether it is bought the last day before the end of the year of assessment or two months before the year of assessment we're just going to add it to the written down value brought forward and that is going to be how we account for the assets to calculate capital allowance however assets in pool four and pool five do not lose their identity okay they do not lose their identity what does that mean it means that when there is an addition of pool four and pool five we put them or we put those addition in a new subgroup in the main group so for instance if the entity had a building and then subsequently they bought another building or they constructed another building that means that we will have pool four a pool 4b and we'll count account for that separately why because assets in pool 4 and pool 5 do not lose the identity but assets in pool 1 to pool 3 lose the identity so any addition during the year we just add it to the pool and we calculate our capital allowance in that regard so that is how we deal with additions in class 1 to class 3 class 4 to class 5 please note that if it is the first year of assessment that we are calculating the capital allowance for the entity then it is important that we take into consideration the number of days or uh, yes the number of days that the uh, assets have been used so if this is the first year of assessment that we are dealing with so the entity started a business on say first march right and their year of assessment or their year ended is say 30th september and we are preparing the financial statement for that first year ended it means that we are going to be calculating the capital allowance from the first march to 30th of september but you don't use the month you have to use the number of days so march how many days are there april how many days may june july august september then you 
count all of the days together divided by 365 and that is how you are going to be calculating the capital allowance and this is exclusive for the very first year of assessment of the entity but in subsequent measurements like we said any addition pool one to pool three you put it into the pool because they will lose the identity and then you charge your full year capital allowance irrespective of the time that the asset was bought so that is how we deal with the additions or purchases of assets in the different classes of the asset group how about disposal when there are disposals all we do is again subtract the disposal from the pool of the assets period we subtract the disposal. So if it is pool one to pool three, we are dealing with it. We bring our written down value brought forward simply. If there is any addition, add any purchases for the period, and then you less any disposal. That is the amount on realization. The proceeds we got from the realization of the asset is going to be subtracted, and you get the restated balance, and that restated balance will be what you are going to be using to now charge your capital allowance for the period now what if the whole class of assets is disposed of it means there's nothing there so if the whole class of asset or the pool is disposed of then what is going to be happening is that we are going to be looking at the difference between the proceeds we got and the written down value brought forward and if it happens that the proceeds it's greater than the written down value brought forward that means we got a gain on the disposal and that gain on disposal will be included in the chargeable income of the entity and taxed because remember again um capital gain now is 25 percent not 15 percent again it's 25 percent so if the proceeds exceeds the written down value that excess amount will just be added to the chargeable income in arriving at the corporate tax liabilities of the entity the reverse is true so if the process is less than the written down value then that means the entity made a loss that loss will be treated as an allowable deduction in arriving at the chargeable gain or the chargeable income of the entity for the year of assessment under review so when it comes to disposal also these are the rules that guide disposal so generally when it comes to dealing with capital allowance these are the broad principles that we must understand please note in addition to these broad principles that is dealing with the pooling system how we deal with um additions how we deal with disposal so it is very important you understand that there are some cases where there could be exchanges so maybe an asset could be exchanged for a land or another asset it's going to be dealt with in the same way because that asset that is exchanged, the fair value of that asset becomes like the realization, which will be deducted. And if that asset that was exchanged is a depreciable asset, then it will also be added into the group that we have to add it to. So you want to pay attention to that also very well as you are looking at these things generally when it comes to the issue about capital allowance. Finally, it's going to be the fact that because it is important for you to know the classes or know the asset groups that are going to be included in each class, what you want to do is that before you leave, before you put your book away and go into the example, you want to quickly glance through, okay, class one, these are the items there, class two, these are the items there, class three, these are the items there. Usually, the problem is going to be the categorization between the class one uh, sorry the class two and the class three assets that's where sometimes the challenges are going to be now remember if you screw up the classification maybe there's a class two asset and you put it in class three you just screwed up big time in that regard so you want to be mindful of the classifications and the assets groups that will be recognized in specific areas in that regard so that is the issue that you must understand when we talk about capital allowance it's a fundamental principle that you have to understand when it comes to dealing with principles of taxation or if you want advanced taxation second principle just 
in connection to this, it's going to be the issue in relation to acquisition of assets. Now, before I go to the acquisition of assets, let me talk about advanced taxation when we are in um, petroleum and mining operations. Because when we are in petroleum and mining operation, the capital allowance issue, we don't deal with pooling system. We don't do any pooling system here. So what is going to be happening is that all costs that are going to be incurred from the reconnaissance to uh, exploration to mining will be put into a single pool and capital allowance is going to be granted on a straight line basis over five years or at 20 percent if it is a mining environment exploration development then when production begins everything is going to put into a single pool and capital allowance is going to be granted over five years or at 20 percent straight line so advanced taxation when we are dealing with capital allowance petroleum and mining operations that is the rule that we are going to be dealing with that always capital allowance is going to be on straight line basis over a five-year period so if for instance we have a scenario where we are giving the written down value brought forward we are giving the written down value brought forward for say let's say four thousand and then we are told that oh this asset had been used for two years okay so if the asset had been used for two and we are in a mining environment for two years that means they've charged depreciation or capital allowance for two years since it's a mining company that means this four thousand here represents three more years to go so if i want the capital allowance for the current year of assessment and the review i'll just take that four thousand divided by three and that gives me the capital allowance for the current year of assessment i subtract that then i get my written down value brought down so when it comes to capital allowance in petroleum and mining environments this is how we deal with it and that is what you need to understand there so that's principle number one capital allowance and its rules we come to principle number two and that is acquisition of assets when an entity is seeking to acquire assets there are a couple of options available to the entity and it is important we understand the tax implication of the various acquisition methods that an entity is going to be electing or using for the most part so either the entity will undertake an outright purchases or the entity is going to go and lease the assets what is the rule governing these two very simple if the entity goes and undertake an outright purchases then simply if the asset is a depreciable asset then certainly that asset is going to be put into its pool and then capital allowance will be granted but remember if the asset is a non-commercial asset then the cost of the asset will be capped back to 75,000 Ghana City for tax purposes. Sometimes the examiner could be generous and remind you of that. But if the examiner is not generous and it happens that it's a non commercial asset like a Pajaro, a Range Rover, like those luxury SUVs or vehicles, then no matter the cost that the entity incurred to purchase those vehicles or that vehicle, it's going to be capped back to 75000 co for capital allowance purposes. Note, the fact that we cap it back to 75000 does not mean when that asset sells subsequently, the proceeds that come from the asset, we will cap it or prorate it in accordance with the 75000 No. If we sell that asset subsequently, how much we sold it for or we are going to sell it for that will be the proceeds we are going to be bringing in deducting from the pool when we are calculating the capital allowance for the current year under review so that is something that is very important that although when you buy the asset and it's a non-commercial asset and you are going to be capping it to seventy-five thousand, if subsequently that asset is sold we don't cap the proceeds the whole process is going to be brought and deducted from the whole pool and then we would deal with it and find out okay maybe there is a gain there is a loss or what we will do subsequently so outright purchases the asset is bought we add it to the pool that it belongs we grant capital allowance based on the rules of the pool class one forty percent class two thirty percent class three twenty percent class four ten percent 
class five economic useful life of the asset and all of those things notes that goodwill is not a depreciable asset and hence depreciation cannot be granted on goodwill land is also not a depreciable asset so depreciation or capital allowance will not be granted on land so that is why in the pooling system land acquisition you don't see it coming anywhere because land is not considered a depreciable asset goodwill also is not a depreciable asset so for these two items capital allowance shall not be granted so you want to make sure you understand that very well but alternatively the entity could choose to lease the asset now when the entity leases the asset you know that the entity is going to make lease payments every year so the annual lease payment if you are a good student from the leases environment you know that lease payments have two components we have the capital elements okay and then we have the finance element so there are two elements here now this is the rule for explanation purposes the capital elements will be granted as a capital allowance okay the capital element will be granted as a capital allowance for the most part and then the finance elements will be treated as deductible expenses or if you want allowable expenses so in principle all the lease payment will be deductible all right in principle all the lease payment will be deductible in principle just that you don't say it that oh like the lease payment will be deductible for tax purposes no you got to split the two that the capital element will be granted as a capital allowance and then the finance element will be granted as a deductible expenses now there is a catch here for the advanced audit and assurance students that if a petroleum mining company leases an asset please take this very well this is for the advanced taxation students if a petroleum mining company leases an asset yes the capital element will be granted as a capital allowance but when it comes to leases in the petroleum mining company we are going to still apply that 20 percent straight line or over five year period so that the capital element that is being paid we are going to do 20 over 100 times that capital element and that will be the capital allowance the company can get in respect of the capital element but the finance element in mining and petroleum still all of it will be treated as a deductible or allowable expenses so that is just a little catch there for the level three students dealing with the issue about leases so these are the two options available for leasing an asset so for tax planning purposes let's say that an entity wants to buy a vehicle maybe a range rover or maybe a pajaro or you know the, some of these non-commercial vehicles okay for tax purposes which one will be appropriate for them they could decide to do outright purchase but remember when you do outright purchases of these vehicles probably 20 250 000 ghana city for tax purposes the tax authority will say uh-uh you don't need an a range rover to run any business so for tax purposes that two hundred and fifty thousand will be cancelled we would rather give you 75,000 Ghana City for tax purposes. So it's going to be treated as 75,000 Ghana City, although you pay 250,000 Ghana City for it. And that is outright purchases and capital allowance will be granted in accordance with whatever pool system that is going to belong. Usually that is going to be class three. But if we decide to lease that same vehicle, then the lease payment we make every year the capital element will be granted as a capital allowance the finance element will be deductible there is no cap there so for tax purposes it will be better for the company to lease such vehicles rather than to outrightly buy them because when they buy there will be a cap but when they lease everything can be written off against the income that they have earned and so from from tax planning perspective that is the idea about that and that is the issue we must understand so that is the second thing acquisition of assets 
outright purchases, lease of assets, and the treatments that we have to undertake in respect of that. The third thing is going to be the issue in respect of the entity seeking to make finances or finance its operations for the most part. So let's look at the tax implication of a couple of things. Now for advanced taxation students, you're going to have a lot of tax implication of these and I've told you this over and over again in uh, our individual classes there will be a lot of tax implication issues so we want to just remind ourselves on some of the issues available so number one let's say that an investor always remember the perspective that you are writing so an investor is seeking to make an investment so what is the tax implication okay the investor can buy shares equity shares or the investor can give it out as a loan to the entity what is the tax implication on that all right when the tax when the investor buys shares in a company the shares will qualify the investor to receive future income in the form of dividend that future income coming in the form of dividend will be subject to a withholding tax of what eight percent so as and when the entity declares dividend, then that 8% tax will be withheld from the amount of uh, dividend payable or receivable by the investor. But if the investor chooses to give loans instead of equity shares, buying shares, the loan will also bring in future income in the form of interest. So the annual interest payable will also be subject to a withholding tax of eight percent so again this is from the perspective of the investor you have to always be mindful of the context of the question whose perspective am i writing from so from the perspective of the investor equity instruments or equity shares means future dividends eight percent withholding tax loan notes future interest every year that interest would be paid and so eight percent withholding tax will be charged on it so between the two which one is right it depends on the risk appetite of the investor but these are the tax implications the only issue is that with the loan because the interest will be paid every year it means the annual interest will be subject to a withholding tax of eight percent but with the shares it is only when the entity declares dividend that is where the eight percent is going to be charged on the dividend so I don't know maybe shares will be better than the uh, loan but it will depends on the risk appetite of the investor and what the investor is seeking to do so when an investor is seeking to make investment these are the two options available and the tax implications of this then let me flip it up to the perspective of the entity so if an entity is also seeking to raise finance so this is an entity seeking to raise finance so if an entity is seeking to raise finance there are a couple of options available what i mean by raise finance is the entity is seeking to increase its capital so if the entity is seeking to increase its capital what are the options available and what are the tax implications of the options again know the perspective you are coming from number one the entity may elect to issue shares okay the entity may elect to issue shares okay issuing shares what we mean be is you know issue share for cash or doing a right issue because if the entity does a bonus issue there's not going to be any cash coming in i'm going to talk to you about the tax implication of a bonus issue in a moment i'll deal with that as a um item on its own the tax implication of bonus issue so if an entity issue shares what's the tax implication of that for the most part yes their capital has gone up so what is going to be happening they have to pay a stamp duty of 0 0.5 percent on the additional or increased capital sounds good the additional or increased capital 
the additional or increased capital. So maybe at the beginning of the year, their share capital was 10,000. Then in the middle of the year, they have issued some new shares. Now it's 15,000. Then they have to pay a stamp duty of 0.5% on that additional share capital. That is one way the entity can increase its capital and the tax implication. Number two, the entity can increase its capital as well the shares in issue by making a bonus issue remember bonus issue doesn't bring cash to the entity bonus issue is simply changing the reserves of the company into share capital we don't mind it is your deal but what is the tax implication of bonus issue anytime an entity makes a transfer from the retained earnings or the income surplus into the share capital there is a bonus issue there. The big question we ask ourselves is, what is the tax implication of bonus issue? There are two tax implications of bonus issue. Number one is that, yes, the share capital is going up, so there has to be stamp duty, okay, of, again, 0.5% on the amounts transferred. Sounds good? On the amounts transferred. Because as far as... Now, please note that, I mean... In practice, the rate is different, but for the purpose, we're going to just stay with a 0.5% and go away. So there will be a stamp duty of 0.5% on the amount that has been transferred. But the second tax implication for a bonus issue is that the tax authority would deem that as a dividend. The tax authority would deem the bonus issue as a dividend. Why? Because you were supposed to have given that money to the shareholders, but here you are, you have converted their dividend, quote-unquote, into share capital. We don't care. The tax authority will see that as dividend. And so that amount, the amount that has been transferred, we will have to charge a withholding tax of 8% on it so that is also the tax implication when an entity makes a bonus issue so if we are issuing shares no p stamp duty 0.5 percent on the additional or the increase in the capital no p but if you make a bonus issue two tax implications the tax authority would deem it as a dividend and so withholding tax of eight percent is going to apply then you pay the stamp duty of 0.5 percent also on the additional amount please note it is not five percent it is zero point five percent and you have to be careful when punching zero point five percent because if you screw up the calculation you're going to screw it up as well in that case but that is bonus issue there three the entity can also increase its capital through debt finance and when it comes to debt finance there are th two things we want to look out for either the entity will borrow the money from you know a resident financial institution or unrelated party okay a resident financial institution or unrelated party in such cases no p you borrowed money okay so the interest paid will be deductible for tax purposes does that make sense? So the interest is deductible for tax purposes. So if an entity, you know, goes to take some loan from the bank, yeah, loan is deductible for tax. Interest is deductible for tax purposes. No P. Or from another entity that they, are, they don't have any relationship with, the interest they pay to them will be deductible for tax purposes. But if the entity decides to go for a debt finance from a non-resident entity or a resident entity that has a controlling interest in the entity with controlling interest then not all the interest may be deductible for tax purposes please stay with me carefully here so in the second scenario Maybe we have a subsidiary in Ghana and they have their parent company in Germany. And so, you know, as Ghana is going through crisis and the parent company in Germany says that, hey, listen, we, we want to fund you. And so they send them, you know, one million pounds or one million euros or one million dollars. OK, that's a good money, but it is coming from their parent company. Not all the interest expenses on that loan 
will be al- may be allowable for tax purposes i'm using the word may be allowable for tax purposes because i'm going to explain that to you in a moment or they borrowed the money from a company here in ghana a resident entity but the company they borrowed from actually controls them so maybe they have a parent company but the company is in ghana and they are borrowing the money from them in such scenario also not all the interest expenses may be allowable for tax purposes and this is where our thin capitalization concepts come to town so the thin capitalization concept applies so in the second scenario where the entity is borrowing money from a non-resident person a non-resident entity what will be the tax implication all the entity is borrowing money from a resident entity that controls them a resident parent entity then thin capitalization rule will apply stay with me carefully you're gonna love this now what a, what is the thin capitalization rule anyways pretty simple the thin capitalization rule simply says that the tax sorry the debt allowable for tax purposes shall not exceed three times the equity of the entity that's it the tax sorry the debt allowable for tax purposes shall not exceed three times the equity of the entity Uh uh-oh what is equity here you got to be careful equity here is the share capital plus retained earnings or what we call income surplus sounds good retain earnings or income surplus these two guys will give us the equity so be careful if in the question we have share premium share capital retain earning revaluation surplus other components of equity it's all a trap you are interested in only two things the share capital and the retained earnings or income surplus because remember another name for retained earnings is income surplus so it is these two guys added together that will give us equity now when you add that equity up times three will give us the debt allowable for tax purposes so this is the deal so you first have to work out your equity figure second you work out the debt allowable for tax purposes by multiplying the equity figure by three so that you get a debt allowable now this is the catch you have to then find out what is the outstanding loan at the beginning of the year okay what is the outstanding loan at the start of the year i want you to be mindful of this because the we could be told in the question that oh the parent entity in germany gave them one million dollars two years ago but as at the current year ended in review the amount outstanding is two hundred thousand dollars okay so which figure do you use is it the debt originally 1 million or the 200,000 that is currently outstanding it is always the debt outstanding at the beginning of the current year of assessment that is the figure you're going to work with you want to make sure you do that very well so we look at the debt outstanding at the beginning of the year now if it happens to be denominated in a foreign currency the examiner will give you the exchange rate so you convert or get the exchange rate into uh you convert the foreign currency into the debt in ghana city so that you can work your flow but what you're going to do is to compare your outstanding loan at the start of the year to the debt allowable for tax purposes which you had calculated for and this is the rule if the outstanding loan at the beginning of the year is greater okay the outstanding loan is greater than the debt allowable then not all the interest expenses payable for that year and any foreign exchange loss for that year will be allowable for tax purposes So this is where you would then have to continue with your calculation to say that okay the interest allowable for tax purposes will be you know the debt allowable which you calculated for divided by the outstanding debt which will be in the question multiplied by the interest expenses that's how you get your interest allowable then you now calculate your interest to be disallowed and that interest to be disallowed will be added back in arriving at the capital sorry chargeable income of the entity so 
again let's go through the flow when the thin capitalization comes to play thin capitalization comes to play when an entity borrows money from a non-resident parent entity number one number two when an entity borrows money from another resident entity that controls them so we are a subsidiary and we borrow money from our parent company that is in ghana here then thin capitalization will come to town how do we do that we first have to calculate the debt allowable for tax purposes and the debt allowable for tax purposes shall be three times the equity what is equity equity is the share capital plus the retained earnings or the income surplus once we get our debt allowable for tax purposes we go and find out what is the debt outstanding at the beginning of the year we now compare the debt outstanding at the beginning of the year to the debt allowable if the debt outstanding exceeds the debt allowable then not all the interest expenses and any foreign exchange losses arising from capital repayment will be allowable for tax purposes so we will then continue with the calculation to calculate the interest allowable then we will get the interest to be disallowed which will be added back to the chargeable income of the entity and then we calculate we do the same calculation for the foreign exchange loss allowable using the same concept and then we get the foreign exchange loss to be disallowed and all that will be added as well to the chargeable income of the entity however if we do the comparison and we see that oh the debt outstanding stay with me the debt outstanding at the beginning of the year is less than the debt allowable then that is thanks be to god it means all the interest expenses and any outstanding any uh, foreign exchange loss will all be allowable for tax purposes so you end here no other workings no other adjustments no other talking because all the interest expenses and the foreign exchange laws will be allowable for tax purposes so no adjustment no treatment is going to be required but you have to understand this that whether we are going to allow or disallow do adjustment or not do adjustment when we are taking the loan from a non-resident company there has to be the interest on the withholding tax there has to be a withholding tax on the interest which the entity must withhold okay at eight percent and pay that to the ghana revenue authority so whether all the interest will be the allowable or part of the interest will be allowable we don't care the total interest payable for the year we have to charge an eight percent withholding tax and remit that to the ghana revenue authority then the final part is here is this and this is also another important thing that you know you have to note where an entity has a negative equity then they don't qualify to borrow so in that case all the interest expenses and any corresponding foreign exchange losses will be disallowed for tax purposes so let's say you are calculating your equity and you have your share capital coming in probably hundred thousand dollars and then you have your retained sorry hundred thousand ghana city let's put some respect on ghana city you know and we have our retained earnings coming in, and that is negative 150,000. Uh oh. That means the equity is negative 50,000. You don't qualify to borrow. In this scenario, all the loan, no all the interest expenses, and any foreign exchange losses will be disallowed for tax purposes, and we have to go and add them back to the chargeable income of the entity and these are the things you must understand when we talk about thin capitalization and it is arising why because the entity want to raise capital and they are raising the capital from debt finance and the loan is being given to the entity by a non-resident parent entity or a resident entity that is their parent or that controls them generally that is the third scenario on how an entity can increase 
its share capital and the tax implication of that. Remember, when the thin capitalization rule applies, the interest that is disallowed for tax purposes is lost forever. So the entity cannot recover from that. The entity cannot get any benefits from that. It's lost and it's gone forever and ever. But that is the idea about a tax implication when an entity is seeking to raise finance generally. Next one, it's going to be the issue about Again, a foreign investor seeking to invest in Ghana, what are the options available? So let's say an entity is seeking to have presence in Ghana. So an entity is seeking to have presence in Ghana. What are the tax implications? Remember, there are two things you need to understand. We are what we call trading in Ghana, okay? And then trading with Ghana. They are not the same trading in ghana and trading with ghana are not the same trading in ghana means that the entity has a presence here in ghana is carrying out activity in ghana and so the income that they earn in ghana will be subject to tax in ghana that is trading in ghana trading with ghana means the entity has no presence in ghana hence there will be no tax implication on them. So if a Turkish company is trading with a Ghanaian company, you can't go tax the Turkish company. Why? Because they don't have a presence in Ghana. That is called trading with Ghana. You cannot tax their income because they didn't do anything here. Unless otherwise they executed a job here in ghana so let's say it's a repairs and maintenance maybe you bought a plant and they are coming to do repairs for you then because they did the repairs here in ghana when you are paying them the entity will charge withholding tax other than that trading with ghana there is no tax implication okay so when this foreign entity is seeking to have presence in Ghana, meaning trading in Ghana, there are two options that they can elect to go for. And it's something that we need to understand. They can come in as a permanent establishment, meaning they register the company as an external entity. Okay. Uh, as a branch here in Ghana, or they can have an independent subsidiary here in Ghana. These are the two options. It is important we understand the tax implications of the two. Number one is going to be stamp duty. When they register the company as a branch, as an external company, because there is no stated capital, there will not be any stamp duty. But if they register the company as a subsidiary, independent subsidiary in Ghana, there will be a stated capital. So on that stated capital, they would have to pay a stamp duty of 0.5%. Number two, if they register the company as an external company, then what is going to be happening is that at the end of the year, whatever profit that they are going to take back to the parent company because it's a branch, any profit expatriated, there has to be a withholding tax of 8% charge on it. So there will be branch profit after tax of 8% branch profit after tax of 8%. But if they register the company as an independent subsidiary here in Ghana, there's not going to be any branch profit after tax. So they're not going to face any branch profit after tax. Number three, if they register the company as a branch, there will not be any dividend payments. So there will not be any withholding tax on dividend. But if they register the company as an independent subsidiary here in Ghana, when the subsidiary in Ghana declares dividend, that dividend will be subject to withholding tax of 8%. Now, so get a relationship. The external company will repatriate the profit. So the profit they are repatriating, the branch profits of the tax 8% applies. But if it is a subsidiary, it is not a branch, so it's about dividend. So there will be a dividend withholding tax of 8% if there is a subsidiary. Another difference between these two is that when the parent entity, that is the parent outside of Ghana, lends money to the 
operation here in Ghana and the operation here in Ghana is an external company, meaning it's a permanent establishment, then the thin capitalization rule shall not apply, meaning the interest shall not be deductible for tax purposes. But if they register it as a subsidiary company, then when they lend money to that subsidiary, the thin capitalization rule will apply in respect of the deductibility of the interest expenses and the subsequent foreign exchange losses arising from the capital repayment. That is also another distinction that we need to understand. In the two cases, they all must be operated and taxed as Ghanaian companies. What does that mean? It means that they will do PAYE, they will do VAT withholding tax, they will do all manner of things that every Ghanaian company does. The corporate tax payable, the two of them will be paying. So on that side, they are all the same. So the difference is arising from stamp duty, branch profits after tax, dividend withholding tax and then the fact that if the foreign entity lends money to the branch thin capitalization rule doesn't apply because you cannot do that it's a branch so no deductibility of the interest expenses for tax purposes but if it is a subsidiary then the interest and the foreign exchange laws may be deductible up to the limit when it comes to dealing with the thin capitalization concept so these are the differences that we can talk about in respect of permanent establishment and a subsidiary it's a tax planning environment that the examiner can throw at you and ask you which one will be right for the entity to use usually the subsidiary option is good especially because of the borrowing part or the lending part because whether i like it or not the foreign operation will have a better source of funding to lend money to their operation here in ghana rather than allowing the entity to go and borrow the money from the bank because if they lend it to them they will get the interest benefit and that increases the growth of the group rather than giving that interest to a financial institution so among the two or between the two subsidiary option will be the best for tax purposes from the perspective of the investor when they are looking at these two options Okay, so I'm seeing something here. Um, yes, Josephine, your hand is up. Is she? Yep. Please, so um, about the differences, can you take it again? It feels like, as I got my confused, Kaka, there's a bit of confusion in the about classifying the difference between the permanent establishment and then the subsidiary. Okay, so what are, what we are saying here is that what we are saying here is that if we are dealing with permanent establishment, they don't have stated capital, so there will be no stamp duty applied because they are registering the company is being registered as a branch. But if it is a subsidiary, it will have a stated capital, hence stamp duty will apply. Number two, if the company is an external company or a permanent establishment or a branch, then branch profits after tax will apply on the expatriated profit. But that will not apply in subsidiary because there will not be any branch profit after tax. Next, subsidiary, when they declare dividend, and that dividend which is payable to the parent entity, the dividend will be subject to withholding tax of 8%. But the branch or the external permanent establishment cannot declare any dividend, so there will not be any dividend withholding tax. Next, when these two companies borrow money from the parent entity, we are saying that the branch company does not qualify for writing off the interest or the, uh, how do we call it, the foreign exchange losses arising from the repayment of the loan note. Thin capitalization doesn't apply to a permanent establishment or a branch. But it's going to be applying in the case of a subsidiary. Among all, in addition to these four differences, the similarities is that all of them will be operating as normal companies here in Ghana. And so VAT, without PAYE, all of those corporate taxes issues, they're going to be paying. On the basis of these differences, 
most part it will be better for the foreign entity to have a presence in ghana through a subsidiary rather than having a permanent establishment or a branch does that make sense let me know if that makes sense yes sir thank you all right okay so that is the idea about a company seeking to have presence in Ghana. Now, in the uh, in the concept of permanent establishment as a thing, there are two things you have to understand about permanent establishment. We have what we call Ghanaian permanent establishment and then foreign permanent establishment. Please stay with me carefully here. Don't be fooled by the names. Stay with me. When we say a Ghanaian permanent establishment, it is an external company in Ghana owned by a foreign entity. Let me take that again. A Ghanaian permanent establishment is an external company or a branch entity in Ghana owned by a foreigner. So when we say, oh, that foreign investor or entity should have a presence in Ghana through permanent establishment, we are talking about a Ghanaian permanent establishment. So like that is why I said, don't be fooled with the name. Because when you hear Ghanaian, you say, oh, this is for a Ghanaian. Oh, this is a Ghanaian company. Mm -mm. Ghanaian permanent establishment is a permanent establishment, a branch company located in Ghana owned by a foreign entity or a non-resident entity. Foreign permanent establishment, on the other hand, is a permanent establishment or a branch entity located in a foreign country owned by a resident of Ghana company yep that's the idea so that's the difference between Ghanaian permanent establishment and foreign permanent establishment Ghanaian it is in Ghana owned by non-residents foreign it is in another country owned by residents now, it is important you understand this also very well because, like I said earlier, for the Ghanaian permanent establishment, the tax laws that we explained earlier is going to be applying to them for the most part in that particular case. But when we are dealing with foreign permanent establishment, meaning a resident, a resident of Ghana has gone outside Ghana and established an external company there, it is called foreign permanent establishment. What is the tax implication of that? Pretty simple. We are going to be saying that the first 186 days or the first six months of operation income will be added to the income of the resident's company and taxed. But if that foreign permanent establishment earned money outside that six months period or any money they earn after the six months period, that will not be included in the determination of the chargeable income of the entity. So that is also something that we must understand when we talk about permanent establishment so an investor seeking presence in ghana permanent establishment is there and then we can also have a subsidiary coming into the picture then let's broaden the discussion a little bit let's broaden the discussion a little bit still let's say that an investor is seeking to you know buy shares okay investor or is seeking to buy shares let's say a resident entity it's seeking to make investments okay so they are seeking to buy shares in companies okay so equity investment please stay with me this is a very fundamental principle that you must understand as well so when an investor or a resident entity is seeking to buy equity shares what is the tax implication here okay there are three things I want you to take away. Like I said, stay with me carefully because this is really an interesting area that you're going to fall in love with in the next few minutes. Three things I wanted you to take away from here. Number one is if we are dealing with traditional companies. I've told you what the heck traditional companies are. I'm going to say it again. Don't worry. Number two is 
free zone enterprises. Number three is companies operating in the mining or petroleum companies. Mining and petroleum sector. Stay with me. The tax implication is not the same. Stay with me. I am talking about from the perspective of the investor. I am always mindful and I want you to always be attentive to the context of the question because if you don't know whose perspective you are writing from, you're going to write things that will digress and you get zero for wasting your time. So I am coming in from the perspective of the investor. I am coming in from the perspective of the entity making the investment. So the question we ask ourselves is, what is the tax implication if an entity, an investor, seeks to make investment in another company? What is the tax implication? Okay. Each of the investments will result into future income in the form of what? Dividend. So the question we ask ourselves is, how do we tax that dividend? What is the tax implication of that dividend? Stay with me. Traditional companies, that is companies that are operating outside the free zone, outside petroleum and mining operations, the taxation of the dividend depends on the percentage of ownership. Depends on percentage of ownership. Stay with me. What does that mean? Any ownership that is above 25% means that the dividend is tax exempt. You don't tax it. It's a free money the entity is receiving. But if the ownership is less than 25%, then the dividend will be subject to a withholding tax of 8%. That's the first thing you must understand. So we have acquired shares or we are seeking to acquire share in a company that is not a free zone company, in a company that is not a petroleum or a mining company. What is the tax implication? Okay, our investment will give us dividend, future income in the form of dividend. But that dividend will be taxed dependent on our percentage of ownership, the percentage that we buy. So if we buy more than 25%, the dividend is going to be tax exempt. So it's free money we are getting. But if we buy below 25%, uh -oh, it doesn't become free money. Ado D is going to take 8% to fly around the world. What do you think? So it's going to be subject to a withholding tax of 8%. Okay. What if we make an investment in a free zone enterprise? Now remember for advanced taxation students, Free zone enterprise is something that is going to be there. Sorry, sorry. Let me rephrase myself because I want to be careful. It's a very sensitive season. I, I didn't say it's going to be there. So let me rephrase myself because some of you at, at this time, your brain and the way things are capturing, I don't want anybody to come and say, oh, Sharon said this thing is going to come, but it didn't come. Please, let me rephrase. For advanced taxation students, for the most part, Free zone enterprises may be in the exam hall. And you have to understand the tax implication generally for generally for free zone enterprises. I'm going to come to that in a moment. But if we buy shares in a free zone enterprise, what do we get? The dividend is exempted from tax. It's free money. It's tax exempt. Period. Free money. Why? Because for free zone enterprises, I mean, you know the rules for free zone enterprises already. Uh, it can be owned 100% by a resident company, a non-resident company. They enjoy a tax holiday of, you know, 10 years. All those things are, they are seeking to review them because of the crisis we are in right now. But, you know, for the purpose of our exam, 100% owned by Ghanaian, 100% owned by foreigner. You know, they enjoy a tax holiday of 10 years, da 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 da. Dividend is going to be exempted from tax, all of those things. Then, the free zone enterprise primarily is required to export what they do for the most part. However, there is, there is this thing there. So, minimum of 70% of their produce must be exported. And, you know, they can sell up to. 
30% less than or equal to on the domestic market. On the domestic market. Then one thing that is significant about free zone enterprise is that they are exempted from import duties. Yeah, they are not supposed to pay the import duties. So there is less administration work on them from the GRA perspective. But there is a catch there. Always note that if the examiner throws a free zone enterprise question at you, you need to assume that the entity has finished enjoying their tax holiday. So it is after the tax holiday. Now, after the tax holiday, anything that they sell, we expect them to still export all of them, but at least 70% should be exported. That 70% that they export, no problem. They're not going to pay import duties, VAT, and all of those things. Why? Because import duties and VAT are charged only on goods and services consumed in Ghana. So because those things are not going to be consumed in Ghana, that is why they are, not, they are going to be exempted from the payment of import duties and all those things. However, the 30% that they will sell on the domestic market here in Ghana they would have to pay the import duties, the VAT, the NHIL, and all of those other taxes on that 30% that they are selling here in Ghana. That's the catch. That's the catch. In addition to that, whatever that they are exporting, they will pay a tax of 15%. Domestic market, they will pay a tax of 25%. And so this is where the GRA's administrative work has to be important because sometimes a free zone enterprise can say, oh, we, we took the goods outside of Ghana and so this is the details that we exported the goods not knowing the track did not cross the border. Because if they say they exported it, then they will pay a tax of 15%. Then they can come and sell it on the Ghanaian market. So the GRA must really be monitoring their operations to ensure that if they have exported, then they have exported. If they have sold in Ghana, then they have sold in Ghana. Then we can charge the appropriate tax for them. But that is the idea about free zone enterprises. So for the most part, investment in them 100% exempted from tax and the tax implication for free zone enterprises are some of the things that I shared with you a moment ago. Okay. What if we go buy shares in a mining and petroleum company? Again, stay with me. We are coming from the perspective of the investor. Okay? Not the firm into which... No. The investor firm. We are the ones receiving the dividend. What is our tax implication? Yo. So, if we go and invest in petroleum and mining company here, we don't care about percentage of ownership. It's going to be subject to a withholding tax of 8%. That's it. So, here, irrespective of the percentage of acquisition, withholding tax of 8% shall apply. This is the tax implication of investment in equity. The tax implication of investment in equity. And that's what we must understand. So if a resident entity is seeking to make investment and they have options, company A, company B, company C, okay, which one should they go for? This is the tax implication. So you as a tax consultant, they have come to you. You have to mention the tax implication of all the three and ask and tell them which one they should go for. For the most part, either you acquire more than 25% in a traditional firm so that the money will be exempted from tax or go buy a free zone enterprise so that the money will be exempted from tax if not if you go for mining company you screwed because no, no matter the percentage you acquire eight percent is going to come up to you and then if you acquire less than 25 percent eight percent is also going to come for you so that is the tax implication of this particular aspect dividend that the uh, the entity the entity has made investment in shares the tax implication of the investment. Okay. The next thing I want to share my thoughts on is going to be the issue about taxation of other income. Okay. Tax implication of 
other income. Now, apart from the traditional income of the company, which is the revenue, there are other income that the entity is going to be receiving, and it is important we understand the tax implication of these incomes. Now, before I get excited into the tax implication of this income, you need to understand withholding taxes, which I know you know already because we have what we call the final withholding taxes and then withholding tax on accounts. You must understand the difference between the two. If we say something is a final withholding tax, it means the recipient of the income shall no longer add that income to their accessible or chargeable income. But when we say something is withholding tax on account, then the recipient of the income will add the gross income to their chargeable income or their accessible income for the year. Let's take that again. If withholding tax is a final withholding tax, or we say an income is a final withholding tax, the recipient of the income shall not add the income to their accessible or chargeable income for the year of assessment. But if the income is deemed as withholding tax on account, the recipient of the income shall add the gross income to their chargeable income or accessible income income and in that case we will determine they are tax payable then the amount of tax that has been withheld by the one making the payments to them will be given as a tax credit in arriving at the tax liability of the entity so that is just a quick reminder on final withholding tax and withholding tax on accounts now once we settle that, the first type of income we need to talk about is interest. Note that interest paid by financial institutions, resident financial institutions to individuals is tax exempted. Interest paid by resident financial institution to individuals is tax exempted. And usually interest paid by non-financial institutions to individual usually will come at a rate of 1%, depending on wherever we are in, but usually will be at a rate of 1%. But if an entity receives interest, what is the tax implication of that? The interest will be dealt with as withholding tax on account. What does that mean? It means that we need to get the gross income and add it to the chargeable income of the company, calculate the tax, and then the amount of tax that has been withheld by the financial institution whilst paying us the interest will be given as a deduction in arriving at the tax payable by the entity. So that is the idea about interest income. It's on account. We need a gross. Add it to the chargeable income. Calculate the tax of the entity. And then whatever tax that has been withheld will be given as a tax relief so that we get a tax payable by the entity that is how we deal with interest income it is on account number two is rent income rent income the treatment of rent income depends on the purpose of the premises generally for the most part if the entity is treating the property as an investment property the deal is going to be different but if the property is being treated as, you know, the trading property of the entity, then it will be treated as revenue. So let's take it again. If the company is into rental of properties, then the rental income they receive will be their revenue. And that will be subject to a withholding tax, usually, of 7%. In that particular case, For, sorry, 7.5%, I think so. 7.5%. And that is on accounts. So at the end of the year, the real estate company will gross, will bring the gross amount as their revenue, deduct all their taxes, uh, all the allowable expenses. We calculate the tax that is payable. Then we less all the amount that had been withheld then we get a tax liability or tax payable for the entity. So if the rent income is from a property which is deemed as a revenue generating property, a real estate company, we told in taxes 7.5% on account. 
but if the company is not into renting of properties and they just rent out a surplus office space that they have then that property will be dealt with or recognized as an investment property in that way then the rental income that they receive will be subject to a final withholding tax which means that income will no longer be added to the chargeable income of the entity and usually if it is an investment property if it is a residential property it is going to be taxed at eight percent and if it is a commercial property it's going to be taxed at 15 percent in that particular case so that is the deal about the rental income for the most part this is the area we're going to be coming from investment income so we will have a company that has a surplus office space that they have rented out okay you have a surplus office space that you have rented out all right so that is going to be subject you're going to re get, receive rent rental income but that rental income is final withholding tax they are not supposed to include it again in their profit so if they have already included it what do you do take it out because it's final withholding tax shall not be included any longer if they have not already included thou shall not bring it because it's final withholding tax okay then the last one is going to be dividend income um for the most part let me take that to the next slide dividend for dividend um we said that there are two schools of thought here if they are receiving the dividend from a resident entity and because we've seen these treatments done by the examiner in various examination diets so it can be treated as a final withholding tax in which case you don't bring it again in the flow or it can be treated on accounts in which case you get a gross dividend bomb 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 and then do the calculations as you would do as though it is an interest income and the two treatments we've seen the examiner doing the two treatments in different examination diets so you can apply one of them either as final withholding tax or withholding tax on account it looks like the final withholding tax will be very simple so you go for that right you go for that but if the entity is receiving dividend from a non-resident entity you got to be careful meaning that the entity has investment outside of ghana and they are receiving dividend from the non-resident entity what is the tax implication of that okay we are going to take the gross amounts so the gross dividend will be added to the chargeable income of the entity okay added to the chargeable income of the entity then we calculate the tax liability of the entity afterwards then if ghana has a double tax arrangement with the country of origin of the dividend then the tax withheld in that foreign country on the dividend shall be granted as a foreign tax credit relief and less from the tax liability to get a tax payable so the tax payable would then become the tax liability minus you know the tax withheld on the dividend please note that is if ghana has a double tax arrangement with a country of origin and that leads me to double taxation you know it's an area the examiner is going to enjoy so i've told you the trick that hey if the examiner should ask you oh which countries name eight countries that ghana has double taxation arrangement with you don't have to freak out you just remember the countries that if you get your fu money you can travel to and chances are all the countries you want to travel to ghana has a double taxation arrangement with them all right nigeria you want to go to nigeria right so we have a double taxation arrangement with nigeria ooh, ooh, ooh. okay you want to go to the uk oh we got you there's a double taxation arrangement with the uk oh you want to go to the us oh, we got you there's a double taxation arrangement with the us where else do you want to go everywhere you want to go there is a double tax arrangement almost always for these top top countries you want to go to singapore see beautiful sceneries uh oh there is a double tax arrangement we got you on singapore as well so when it comes to the double tax arrangement if the examiner should ask you list some countries like i said you ask your favorite countries chances are we have a double tax arrangement with them starting from nigeria don't forget nigeria Okay, I know some of you will say, oh, if I get money, I won't go to Nigeria. You won't go to Nigeria. Where do you want to go? You go to Nigeria, you know? That's nice. Just remember, we have a double taxation arrangement with Nigeria. 
or maybe you want to go to Barbados, yeah, or you want to go to the UAE. We got you, okay? We got you also there. So wherever you want to go, chances are there's a double tax arrangement in there. Then we spoke about the issue in respect of importance of tax treaties, limitations of tax treaties. You want to make sure you read all of those things. But the key thing has to do with granting of the double tax relief. Okay. The double tax relief calculation. We said there are two things you need to understand here. We have what we call the relinquish method. What I just told you here is the relinquish method where the tax withheld or paid in that country the total amount of tax will be taken as a deductible allowance before calculating the tax of the company okay so if the entity is going with the relinquish method then the tax withheld in that country or the tax paid let me use it that let me put it that way the tax paid in that country will be given as a deductible allowance so what happens it means we will get the global income okay we'll first bring the resident income of the entity we bring the foreign income of the entity the gross amount and that gives us the global income we will less the allowable deductions from there then we will less the tax paid in the foreign country okay that is a relinquish method so we less the tax paid in the foreign country then we will get our chargeable income right then you can now calculate the tax liability of the company applying the tax rate that is the relinquish method where the entity elect to receive the tax paid in the foreign country as a deductible allowance or a deductible expenses that is the relinquish method so it is given i told you earlier that it is like this but that is not true because here you are bringing the gross amount you calculate your tax payable before you less the tax that was withheld in the foreign country so foreign dividend is different from the relinquish method just want to emphasize that or uh, clarify that for you so that is the relinquish method the tax paid in the foreign country is given as a foreign tax credit okay and it is the deductible expenses and we go away is given as a deductible expenses so we calculate our taxes but the second one is where <laughs> we do the calculation of what we call the effective tax rate etr the effective tax rate so the deal here is that oh you calculate the effective tax rate in the foreign country okay and what is the effective tax rate effective tax rate is simply the tax charged divided by the chargeable income times 100 so you get your effective tax rate in the foreign country okay then you calculate your effective tax rate in ghana remember when you are calculating your effective tax rate in ghana calculating the chargeable income of the individual in ghana you have to include the gross foreign income not the net you include the gross foreign income then you call you do the individual graduated tax rates to determine the tax charge then you calculate the effective tax rate in ghana remember this statement that you will include the gross foreign income in calculating the chargeable income here in ghana that is the catch now when you finish you have the effective rate in the foreign country you have the effective rate in ghana to determine how much foreign tax credits the individual can get we compare the two so scenario number one if the effective tax rate in the foreign country is greater than the effective tax rate in ghana we didn't ask the foreign country to charge you more tax so in that case the foreign tax credit that you will get will be the ghana's effective tax rate okay the ghana's effective tax rate times the gross foreign income times the gross foreign income that is how we calculate the foreign tax credit if the foreign tax rate is greater than the 
effect uh, the um effective tax rate in ghana we didn't ask them to charge you more tax but if it happens that the effective tax rate in the foreign country is less than the effective tax rate in ghana uh oh then in that case all the tax paid in the foreign country will be given us a foreign tax credit so here the tax credit will be equal to the foreign tax paid sounds good so that is double taxation as well and what you need to understand there so companies will usually go with a relinquish method remember it will be stated directly in the question if the entity is electing to go with the relinquish method and remember its treatment it will be subtracted in arriving at the chargeable income because the foreign tax is treated as a deductible allowance or deductible expenses but if we are dealing with individual situation then we have to look at the effective tax rate calculate the effective tax rate in the foreign country effective tax rate in ghana then you know you compare the two if the foreign rate is bigger than the ghana's rate use the ghana's rate on the foreign the gross foreign income that will give you the tax credit the foreign tax credit but if the foreign rate is less than ghana's rate then it will be fair for us to give you all the tax that you have paid in the foreign country as a deduction note also that there are procedures that must be followed when it comes to claiming foreign tax credit number one ghana must have a double tax arrangement with the country in which the income originated that's important then you got to furnish the the ghana revenue authority with the requisite tax documents indicating how much income you gen you got how much tax was paid then they were they are going to communicate with them because they are their buddies so they're going to communicate with them to ask them hey is this person in your books how much money did this person make that da, 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 and all that then they will follow the rules do the calculation and the person will get a tax credit remember another key re condition also is that the one claiming the foreign tax credit or the individual must be a resident so the entity or the individual must be a resident of ghana it's only a resident company that can claim double tax relief or a resident individual that can claim foreign tax relief now time will not permit me to go into determination of the residency status but i believe you know it make sure you understand that because the examiner can throw that at you specifically or that could also you understanding who what we mean by a resident company and a non-resident company you remember that throughout my discussion this evening we've been looking at the discussions from the perspective of non-resident and resident non-resident and resident so please make sure you read through that what do we mean by a resident company what do we mean by a resident individual what are the characteristics make sure you go through that because that is very important there so that is a concept about double taxation and what you need to understand also there then the next principle that i would want to share my thought on will be the issue about financial cost and financial gain you know financial cost and financial gain so when an entity undertakes transactions involving derivative instruments like hedging like currency options like fee, uh, futures like swaps and all of those things these are transactions involving derivative financial instruments and in such transactions the entity is going to be incurring financial cost or the entity will make financial gain or will end gains the question we ask ourselves is what is the tax implication of this you know this already it depends on the type of company that we are using so if we are dealing with traditional companies again you know what a traditional company is by now when we are dealing with a traditional company then the finance cost allowable for tax purposes shall be the financial gain plus 50 percent of the adjusted chargeable income right for traditional companies now you have to calculate that adjusted chargeable income calculation of the ch adjusted chargeable income is the normal chargeable income calculation excluding the effect of both the financial cost and financial gain so 
we will assume that the financial cost and financial gain is never there so the financial cost was deducted so we will add it back the financial gain was added so we're going to subtract it then all allowable expenses will be dealt with disallowable expenses will be added back in arriving at the adjusted chargeable income then we take five percent of that add it to the financial gain and that will give us the financial cost remember any amount of financial cost that is disallowed for tax uh oh give me a sec remember any financial cost that is disallowed for tax purposes what do we do it can be carried over for a period of five years any financial cost that is disallowed for tax purposes can be carried over for a period of five years so that is traditional companies but companies operating in the mining and petroleum operation we said we apply the matching principle Applying the matching principle means nothing about financial cost and financial gain should be in the chargeable income calculation unless otherwise there is excess gain over a cost. So let me explain that. We are using the matching principle. What does that mean? It means the financial cost allowable for tax purposes shall not exceed financial gain. So the financial cost we can allow for tax purposes should be equal to the financial gain for the year. So the matching principle. Now, any excess financial cost can be carried over for a period of five years. Any excess financial cost shall be carried over for a period of five years. Now, in a year where the entity incurs a financial cost without any financial gain, mining and petroleum operation, then the financial cost will all be disallowed for the year and carry over for five years but if they incur or they earn a financial gain without any financial cost then the gain will be added to their chargeable income and tax at their tax rate of 35 percent definitely at the end of the day and so we use the matching principle here matching principle which means that technically unless there is excess financial gain nothing about financial cost and financial gain should be in your chargeable income schedule because you are using the matching principle the cost will cancel the gain so nothing about it will come in your schedule so if the entity has already included the cost you are taking it out if they have uh, included the gain you are also reversing the effect of that then you come and apply the matching principle so that is the idea about the treatment or the tax implication of financial cost and financial gain remember these are financial costs are costs arising as a result of the entity engaging in transactions involving derivative instruments like i said currency options because it's a written question the examiner can ask you everything i've told you in the last one hour 30 minutes can be said as a written question not a calculation although everything i've said is calculation all can be flip up as a written question as well in the exam hall but that is the idea about the tax implication of the financial cost and financial gain then my last flow is gonna be probably the issue the tax implication of mergers you know acquisitions transfers and all of those guys you know them already we said that there is a change if there is a change in the ownership in the underlying ownership of the assets and liabilities of a company within a period of three years then the assets and liabilities of the company is said to have been realized that's all so if within three years there is a change in ownership of the underlying assets of a company then we say that the assets and the liabilities of the company have realized what does that mean it means the company has been sold it means the company has been disposed of 
and that is the same rule that applies on mergers on acquisitions and on transfers what is the implication it means that if within a year there's a change in ownership of more than 50 percent in the underlying assets and liabilities of a company then what happens is that there is a disposal so this is what we said so let's say we have a company kukua limited and then they are to be acquired by another company adoma limited so kukua limited is the target firm adoma limited is the predator firm or the acquiring firm so let's say that adoma limited decides to acquire 70 percent of kukua limited okay the assets and liabilities of Kukua Limited is said to have realized. In that case, any gain on the disposal will be subject to tax. Number two, the new owners, Adoma Limited, cannot benefit from any unrelief losses carry forward, financial cost carry forward capital allowance carry forward and all other uh, carry forward tax benefit that Kukua had before they took ownership of them. Why? Because the assets and liabilities of the company have realized. So they cannot benefit for that. And so for tax planning purposes, we said that in that case, the acquisition should be arranged in such a manner that it will be spread over a year. So you can still acquire that 70%, but spread it over three years. I said over a year, but over three years. So that in year one, acquire 20% because they have a lot of tax deductions or tax benefits that we can benefit from. So year one, you can acquire 20%, no P. In the second year, you acquire 15%. In the third year, you acquire another 10%. Eh? In the fourth year, you know, you acquire in the fifth year you acquire now you've spread the acquisition over a period of more than three years and hence the rules of capping and not benefiting will not apply in that particular case that is the idea about tax implication of acquisition but if they acquire less than 70 percent then certainly the new ownership because the kukua company had not been realized has not been disposed of then certainly the entity can still be accounting for or benefit from all the tax carry forward in that regard the same thing applies to major arrangements okay we said if two firm merge so again kukua limited adoma limited they merge to form a new firm kuku ado limited okay kuku ado limited so that's the new firm and we said that okay in that new firm kukua is owing 35 percent adoma is owing 65 percent what did we say we said that because kukua limited is owning only 35 percent of the new firm we said we will say that the assets and liabilities of kukua limited have realized they have sold their business in that case any gain on that major arrangement the shareholders of Kukua Limited will be subject to the payment of tax on that gain. Then the merge firm, Kukuado Limited, cannot benefit from any tax incentive that Kukua Limited was having prior to the merger. Why? Because that company is no longer there. But if we go to Adoma Limited, they own 65% of the merge firm. That means Adoma Limited has not been realized. In that case, any gain on the merger will be tax exempted and any tax carry forward by Adoma Limited prior to the merger arrangement will still be benefited by the merged firm or the new firm, Kuku Ado Limited. That is the idea about mergers acquisition. So really the rule is simple that if there is change in the ownership of the assets and liabilities of the company within a three-year period of more than 50 percent then we will say that the assets and liabilities of the entity have realized if the assets and liabilities of the entities have realized then any gain on the change in ownership will be subject to tax then any 
tax incentive carry forward financial cost carry forward losses carry forward you know on relief or uh bad debts carry forward and all that cannot be benefited by the new owners these are the things you must understand when it comes to mergers and acquisition as well okay that's the idea about that then i mean pfft, what else the final thing that i could share my thought on will be carryover of losses okay carryover of losses if you remember we said yes all companies now can carry over losses for five years okay all companies can carry over losses from five years Pre previously there was a priority sector but now all companies can carry over losses for a period of five years no problem no cap no limitations they can carry over losses for five years but you need to understand what kind of losses are we talking about so there are two types of losses we can talk about we have what we call business loss and then investment loss if you remember the rules we discussed we said that losses from business can be written of carry forward and written of against business income in the future as well as even investment income in the future stay with me carefully because the, it's very simple but a little bit twist on it so business loss that is the traditional activities of the entity when they make a loss from that that loss can be carry over for five years you know that when they carry over that losses for five years they can write it off against future business income or future investment income but if the entity makes losses from their investment losses from investment can yes be carried over for five years but can only be written off against investment income future investment income does that make sense losses from investment cannot be written off against your business income you cannot do that because you can't go and be greedy and go and make some useless investments and incur losses then you come and write it off against your business income so GRE doesn't get anything Nah, that is not allowed so that is the rule about the losses yes you can carry over losses for five years but be mindful what type of losses are we dealing with and how do we deal with it business loss you can carry it over write it off against business income and investment income but investment loss you can carry it forward but you can write it off only against investment income in the future you cannot write it off against business income so these are some of the things that you need to understand for the most part when it comes to dealing with uh taxation and advanced taxation in that particular case certainly there is the issue about you know the standard tax planning measures tax planning based on the activity uh variable the location variable okay and all of those things then limitations of st tax planning these are important issues you want to make sure you read as well as you go into the example then the concept of transfer pricing we rehash that in our final session uh as we wrap up in our class so you want to make sure that you read the types of transfer pricing and then the various things that has to be understood there because they are things that the examiner could revisit or ask you questions about in that particular case so these are the things that we must understand when we talk about some of the things that you should be on the lookout for as you go into the exam hall now for principles of taxation students definitely we're going to be having VAT something about VAT is going to be in the exam hall withholding tax is going to be there pension it's going to be there so you want to make sure you read on all those things very well and then tax administration this is going to apply for both principles of taxation and advanced taxation there is going to be some level two questions for you in advanced taxation whether i like it or not and for the most part the examiner likes to bring it up on the 
tax administration perspective. Nonetheless, he can bring something on withholding tax, something on VAT, something on capital gains tax, whatever he wants, he can bring. But for those of you in principles of taxation, you're going to have questions on withholding tax, capital gain tax, pensions, VAT, uh, corporate tax liability, fiscal policy, and uh, the issue in relation to um, tax administration. So these are the various things that you have to be mindful of as you go into the exam hall. My final take is going to be that as you go to the exam hall, advanced taxation students especially, I've told you there is a 10% in the exam hall or in your syllabus called communication. Communication simply has to do with the way you are writing out your answers. So be mindful of the pro forma. If the examiner asks you what is the tax implication of something, you must remember the pro forma on how you write the tax implication on something. If you are just supposed to write the thing, then you have your heading coming up, you have your brief intro coming up, you talk about the tax issue. As per the Income Tax Act 2015, Act 8, 96, as amended, da 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 you explain. Then you contextualize to come and then talk about the tax implication of the scenario given to you so based on the above the tax implication of this is going to be this then you come to your conclusion paragraph i hope that this helps you in making your decision you have your closer thank you and then boom 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 you're gone in that particular case so pro forma on the way you write out your english because there's going to be a lot of write-ups because there's going to be a lot of questions about tax implication tax implication tax implication so you want to make sure you remember the uh, pro forma and the various workflows in there then the last thing that i didn't also talk about is taxation of natural resources it's an area the examiner can get excited and get goosebumps on a lot so make sure you read the types of revenue government gets under and this is advanced taxation for under the petroleum and mining sector so we have the income tax we have the carried interest additional carried interest participating interest um what the heck additional oil entitlement surface rentals learn all of those things then remember also the issue in respect of how we deal with the issue in petroleum when it comes to capital allowance i've spoken about that when it comes to financial cost and financial gain i've spoken about that when it comes to dividend i've spoken about that so remember all of those principles and then the calculations remember unless otherwise stated royalties calculation will be five percent unless otherwise stated royalty will be five percent and that will be on the gross production whether the gross uh, revenue from production or the gross production like the number of barrels of oil or the ounces of gold that is produced so make sure that you go through those things very well and the calculations that we did in class we spent a whole session solving questions on some of the issues under mining and petroleum operation yes although the principle primarily is just like corporate tax liabilities there are some minor minor tweaks there that you want to make sure you understand very well so these are some of the things that you want to be mindful of as always make sure you read through the questions thoroughly all the questions all the questions read through the questions thoroughly because that is very very important in the exam or read all the questions and start with what you can do best first remember what i told you know whose perspective you are writing from so you don't screw it up don't just read something or you conclude oh this is what they are talking about take your time hold your breath and make sure you are writing in accordance with the context of the question because it's it's very easy to digress in advanced taxation or principles of taxation so you want to be mindful of the context of the question so read all the questions very well Start with what you can do best first, as always. Take your time to write out, because remember, this is a law. It's an act. If you lie, you are wrong. And I've told you, we are like medical doctors in the tax class, only that our mistakes, 
doesn't kill somebody but could end up could end us in jail so that is the risky part here so be careful if you don't remember the law you don't remember a specific act or the subsection of the act don't go and do giddy giddy eh? and according to an accordance with subsection 5 of whatever the heck but you are lying because subsection 5 of the act is not what you are talking about if you do that you are wrong and so to keep it sweet and simple if you don't want pressure in accordance with the tax provision yeah that's a lazy approach though but that's fine or if you want to sound a little bit professional in accordance with the income tax act 2015 act 896 as amended da 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 boom you go but if you can quote the subsessions exclusively why not that's gonna be great but be careful because if you quote a wrong subsession you are wrong because if you go and quote subsession 2 clause 1 and that is not what is there au revoir may sweet it's like giving you're supposed to give somebody you know almost a slain but you give the person chloroquine like you have killed the person so be careful about that so read the questions very well take your time to understand the context of the question start with what you can do best first largely a lot of the questions are going to be on written questions so make sure you understand the context of the written questions first my my recommendation as always will be read through all the questions and take away all the written and comments questions that you can do best first before you come to the calculation aspect remember any calculation that you are doing in taxation principles of taxation advanced taxation there must be a note attached to your calculation explaining how certain items were dealt with you don't you can't just throw out figures add things subtract things you have to give justification as to why certain things are being added being disallowed and certain things are being deducted you have to put notes down to justify this the workings that you have done please keep that in mind because the conclusion that you reached to say oh let me disallow this you have to write it down if you don't the examiner is going to be deducting you some marks and that will be a punishment for you in the exam hall so these are some of the things that you need to understand for the most part when it comes to dealing with taxation and i'm going to wrap up around here and uh let you go and sleep and tomorrow morning have a nice breakfast revise through the principles well and then you should be able to go in there and pass the examination like i've told you this in the main class the principles in the uh on the portal let that guide you so that could be playing in the background you could be listening to that as you wrap up your studies don't be in a hurry don't try to look at things listen yes solve question i've told you stay away from the past questions nothing in the past question will be duplicated no statements no notes in the past question will be brought so are you wasting your time solving the past questions that's not what i'm saying but you are better off spending time to understand the principles and solving questions outside the past questions because nothing in the past question will be repeated no notes no context will be repeated 99.9% .9 of the time so for all those of you who are past question maniacs and that's all you are doing I don't know what you're doing though but it's not gonna help you spend time understand the principles and when you understand the principles expose yourself to Questions in the question bank, question from other sources, and you can go into the exam hall because the question that the examiner is going to ask you, yes, the topic could be familiar, but that question has never been asked before. The phrasing of the question, the context of the question might not have been asked before. So just learn your notes, cover the syllabus, understand the principles, and that is how you can position yourself to pass the examination so that's it about that we end here today and we wish you all the best god willing tomorrow we are going to meet for thursday's paper or papers i don't know 
on thursday we have public sector and probably and also financial management okay so that'll be for tomorrow public sector and then financial management i think we're going to be focusing a lot on the public sector situation shortly and then we'll be out of this place as well so that's it about that wishing you all the best and go in there and do what you can and we'll see you back here tomorrow 7 p.m if you are doing public sector and financial management au revoir <laughs>